Hey everyone, I'm your friendly neighbourhood host Dre Harrison and welcome back to the WTF1 podcast and wow, this is our first three person show of this new era and uh, wow, excited, can't wait to get going. Uh, with me, I've got Kieran, say hi Kieran again. Uh, hello, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. <laughs> it, to be fair, because this is going to be our first time doing this on YouTube as well. So this may be the first time you've seen some of our faces as well. So uh, there's Kieran. Uh, you may know him from from TikTok. Uh, what was your old TikTok username over there, man? Um, it was Kieran Stroll. I'm Lance Stroll's biggest fan. Yeah, that, remember that one. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's, that's a fun one. And with me as well, making her first ever appearance on Twitch, as well as YouTube. Uh, hello, Hannah. Good to see you. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to get talking about the controversial topic of Drive to Survive. <laughs> yeah, it's, it totally doesn't split the room. Like it's, it's, a, it's a completely straightforward topic that no one's got an opinion on in the grand scheme of things whatsoever. Absolutely not. But uh, yeah, don't worry. Before we really get going into this, um, look, we're not crazy. We, we know the elephant in the room uh we're not tommy and matt that kind of goes without saying if you haven't realized that by now um it's it, it's it's been out there for a little while of course but uh, we did want to address a little bit of that before we get properly into it i mean kieran i think you had something you wanted to say and planned out a little yeah, bit yeah. i've, not, pl I've mm. not planned anything out i don't really yeah, plan really. things because it kills a lot of time in life but mm. <laughs> I, th I think just just because this is the first time on youtube it's the first time like dre says a lot of you will be seeing us I think it's important to talk about this because whilst Dre and I have talked about it on stream before, or the first one we did, um, this will be the first time to address the people on YouTube, which is where the bulk of this audience is. We understand that. And yeah, WTF1 is going through a changes. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed, but a completely different lineup. Matt and Tommy have gone. And I think it's important to just say a couple of things about that. So firstly, Matt and Tommy were not forced out they were not pushed out. They were not fired. They chose this time to go and do something else. So all we can say is wish them absolutely all the best with that. And we're sure it'll be fantastic. And as an add on to that, it's also important to say to you, the viewers, the people who have watched their stuff for years, like me, I'm a massive fan of their stuff. Um, they're not going. You can still watch their content and absolutely do so because they've established a thing here that is so based around them. We understand why it's so weird. I think it's important for us to just say we are massive Formula One fans. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but for years I've been watching WTF1. So I'm under no illusion as to this job being just a walk in the park or something to be taken lightly or taken for granted. But it's also important to remember that we are new to this. Of course, we've all got experience in different elements of the job, different areas, different things we've done slightly in the past. But we're suddenly being put in front of an audience of well, it was 1.2 million, but it's 1.18 million now, which is absolutely <laughs> fine. Um, this is nerve-wracking. This is scary. This is difficult. We are being thrown into something at the deep end, and we just want to do our best. We want to try. We want to do whatever we can to make you happy and feel like you are not losing in quality of video, of output, of podcast, etc. So all we ask is just give us this little period to get adjusted, to get used to this. And at the end of the day, if you've given us a chance and we're not for you, that's absolutely fine. Fair play. No worries at all. Mm. But just let us get over this little little initial period where we're a bit nervous, where we're sorting out new equipment, where we're figuring out formats. And things will look different. I know some people on YouTube have already said, I've got a very boring voice. Much appreciated. <laughs> and the thing is, I'm just trying to avoid being a Matt copy because that's not what we are. No. We're going to be doing our own thing. We will grow into that. But we will never be Matt and Tommy. And I'm as sad as you guys to lose them because I loved watching them. But now things change. We grow, we move on, and new things come up in that place. So thank you to those of us, those of you who've given us a chance so far. And just continue to be patient with us because we will get better and better. Um, so Hannah, have you got anything to add at all? I mean, I would just be echoing everything that you've already said. So <laughs> not particularly, but yeah, I mean, thank you to everyone who has given us a chance and, you know, shown their support we do really really appreciate it and um yeah i'm really excited about you know what's to come we've got lots of really amazing ideas um kieran you've got some crazy but great <laughs> ones um and yeah we're just uh, excited to give you guys some some new and uh, slightly different content to what you're used to but we hope that you like it 
Yeah, I can only echo the sentiment from Kieran. He, he nailed pretty much whatever I was going to say. Um, I mean, just again, first and foremost, thanks to everyone that's given us a fair chance. Um, that's the most we could realistically ask of anybody. I know change is a scary thing. It's, it's scary for us just as much as it is for you guys. Um, it's been an incredible whirlwind experience. I mean, it's only been, gosh, just over two weeks since... Uh, I officially started, or we all officially officially started here. Um, so it, it's been a lot, you know, a lot of tweets, a lot of a lot of comments. Uh, you know, I, I, I try to respond to as many as I can um, because it is daunting. It is a lot, and I just want to say again a massive thank you to everyone that's given us a fair shake. And um, you know, we, we can't wait to get going. We're just as excited, but just as nervous as you know, you guys watching, like. The, trust me, it's not it's not a one sided argument here, I, I, or a one sided, you know, point of view. So, yeah, um, Kieran pretty much nailed it, whatever I was going to say on top of that. But uh, yeah, he nailed it pretty much on on the nose. And yeah, it's just thank you for giving us a chance. Is 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 the is the most humble way I could possibly put it across. Um, so yeah, thanks to everyone for that. Now let's get into the show itself. And now this is going to be a Drive to Survive season five preview um we're going to be talking a little bit about the show itself as an overall concept is it good or bad for formula one it's it, there's a lot of back and forth there's a lot of arguments you can get um you know regarding the show its impact it's it's cultural awareness what it's done for the sport in general there's a lot of different ways you can look at it so we'll be getting to a little bit of that we'll be talking about the best of the show so far, the first four seasons have already come and gone. Uh, season five obviously starting in the middle of like late February, February 24th, I believe. Um, so we'll be getting into some of our favorite moments from previous seasons of the show. Um, and yeah, discussing some of that. And that's going to be fun as well. And then we will also talk about what we think absolutely has to be in season five, which is coming up in just over a month's time. And some of our favorite moments from last season that we feel like they got to get it in there somehow, and we've got to get some more perspective on that. So let's get into the show itself. So let's talk a little bit about DTS in general. This is, like I said, we've had four seasons. We're coming into season five of Drive to Survive. And, well, again, it's it's caused a lot of discussion. And, and again, a lot of it good, a lot of it bad. Um I've I've got a few things I want to say about the show itself, but I'll let you guys start off with. I mean, Kieran, in general, how do you feel about the show and its overall impact so far? <laughs> I think it's it's very difficult because I can completely understand the negative aspects of it, and this is what I'll do very often. I'll start with the opposing point just to get to my point and how I feel about it. But at the end of the day. I can see why people get frustrated at it or have done in the past for the way it's portrayed some events, the exaggeration of rivalries between drivers and like that ending up ultimately in sort of abuse towards people who don't deserve it because it was essentially fictional. Um, Carlos and Lando being a, a good example of that, I think. Um, but I think generally anything that gets more people into something that I like, I like that thing. I think it's important that people become aware of Formula One and just how great it is because it's an intricate sport. I have this a bit with cricket, and I'm not going to keep mentioning other sports, but cricket is something I love, but it's very hard on paper to explain to people to, sort of the, the, the atmosphere surrounding it, the feeling you get watching it, and how invested you can be. And I would kind of equate Formula One to that because if you were just to write out on paper what it is, try and explain every rule, so many people would just go, I can't be bothered with that. And think how many people have now found a platform into the sport because it's been displayed as a human thing. It's human beings being competitive human beings against other competitive human beings. And the things that come out of that, that's what grips a lot of people with sport. And I think anything that gets people into it is a great thing. And anyone who's sort of like, oh, you're if anyone looks down on you for getting into the sport through Drive to Survive, I would suggest... It's not a word I like to throw around, but that is gatekeeping. It's Absolutely. You don't want people who don't know as much as you to qualify to have an opinion or to enjoy something. And that's just a really weird thing in my eyes. Yeah, I I, I, I can certainly see the argument now, Hannah. What, what you were going to say there? No, I, I just, I completely agree. And I feel like Drive to Survive has given people a different perspective of F1. Um, I mean, you know, back in the day, it was very kind of, you know, 
smart and you know straight to the point and f1 you never really saw the personalities of the drivers and you know you could argue that being a good or a bad thing but um drive to survive has definitely shown people more of the backstories behind drivers how they got to the position they're in today and you know more of their personalities which definitely helped um you know them in terms of like fans and numbers I guess but also just those fans being able to connect with the drivers more instead of just seeing them on track which is great but also then and not only for Drive to Survive but things like F1's Grill the Grid on YouTube and stuff like that that's a you know relatively new thing I guess um it all of those things have kind of helped uh the viewers or the fans connect with the drivers more and I feel like that's definitely one of the main reasons why the sport has grown so much yeah I I wanted to piggyback off the back of what Kieran said a minute ago that is my biggest problem with DTS is that and to be fair it's not necessarily a straight up DTS problem I think it's an overall reality TV problem um and I'm going to show my age a little bit here but I remember growing up with in in that MTV era where it was shows like The Hills and I distinctively remember as a kid watching the intro of the show it said in in the intro certain scenes are exaggerated for entertainment value and I was like ah so this is how it's done basically so in other words it's not you know real real reality when it comes to it comes to reality TV but it's a lot of that that I have a problem with and and to be fair I think a lot of us hardcore fans, I mean, if you're watching this stream or going out of your way to watch it, you're probably a hardcore fan of, of the sport in the first place. Um, you're going to notice little things like that. You're going to notice misplaced radio. You're going to notice things taken out of context and then reinserted to basically t- t- have the show tell its own story and not the actual sequence of events or what actually happened um and don't get me wrong they're not the only guilty party in this with dts that is a reality tv issue across the board with how tv works so i don't necessarily hold that against them um but it is i mean if you're a hardcore fan then you're going to notice that and that might be a, a downside for you but at the same time i'd also argue that this show probably wasn't made for us in mind it probably wasn't made for the hardcore fan in mind. It was probably more to do with just trying to get new people's eyes on the sports. Um, and, you know, Formula One, I've always seen as relatively niche in, in the grand scheme of things, um, especially on the global stage. And look, the effective timing of this all with... I mean, season two came out right on top of the global pandemic, right when effectively the world stopped turning. Um, We were all stuck at home with something to do. And on the front page is a curious show advertising Formula One as a sport that I think a lot of people have heard of, but maybe not necessarily watched in that sense. So it was sort of like a lightning in the bottle sort of effect for the sport and the timing couldn't have been better. And I think it's been a huge cultural net positive. Like I've said to people before on a few occasions, like where do you think this new wave of fans was ever going to come from? If it wasn't from a show like this, (laughs) like where was the next explosion of young fans watching formula one going to come from? Because it wasn't off the sport itself. This like, am I the only one that gets that vibe? Because I don't know, Kieran, you've been watching about as long as I have. I mean, the sport I, I, wasn't exactly jumping up and down for popularity, was it? <laughs> no, I don't think so. And it sort of links in with a video I've been doing today about, um, which I, I probably shouldn't talk about, but I've been doing a lot of research on the effects on ticket prices of races just between, say, sort of say 2017 to now. And the jump up is absolutely phenomenal. Obviously, the undertaking of massive sudden fandom in North America is a huge factor. And the money that is coming into that from the sport is just humongous. And would Drive to Survive, is that the only thing that could have done that? Possibly not. But in this age of streaming, and like you say, in the timing with lockdown, nothing could have worked as perfectly if you are at the top brass of Formula One than this has. I think it's paid off exactly how they hoped it would, but probably never could have realistically thought it would. And... Sort of what what you're saying about it's not for the hardcore. I think 
it, it depends how you view the sport. And this is, it's an issue that has been raised a couple of times over the last couple of seasons, most notably in 2021 with Lewis and Max, is what entertainment do you want out of the sport? Is it pure racing or is it pure entertainment? And I think that's what Drive to Survive has potentially introduced to the sport. And I think, I'm not going to say Michael Massey, when he made the decision in Abu Dhabi, and I know we're still talking about this, I apologize, but it's relevant. When he made that decision in Abu Dhabi, I don't think for a second he was thinking, oh, this would be great on Drive to Survive. But I think potentially there was more of a factor of, of so many people are watching this and really don't want this race to end as it, as it should have done, let's be clear. It should have ended under the safety car. But entertainment became a factor more so than ever, quite obviously. And I think maybe that's what worries people in general. It's like how much of this and the way we interpret the rules and the way we look at the sport from the top down is now based on entertainment compared to how it used to be. I think that's a yeah. very valid point. Yeah, Hannah, go on. Yeah, no, I, I feel like in America, but you know, all over the world as well, it I feel like it also depends on how the viewer is watching the sport. Um, because if you see like on the TV guide our oh, British Grand Prix, that's like not gonna entice you to click on it just in the TV guide. But if you see like a 30 second action packed trailer that's got like all these crazy things happening, you're going to want to watch that more. And you're clicking on that because it's entertainment and because that's what it's giving you. So can you really blame people for seeing F1 as more of an entertainment space now than it was? Before? I mean, sport is entertainment in right. itself, but obviously now more so after Drive to Survive, I feel like you can't really blame people for, um, you know, thinking that way about F1 when that the entrance to the sport was that 30 second trailer and they decided to click on it one time, you know? Ab absolutely. I think there is something, I think there's definitely something to that. I mean, every sport to a degree has to contemplate walking that line between integrity and entertainment. I mean, we've all got, they've all got to go down that line when it comes to things like playoff formats and how do you determine how fair a sports league is, um, et cetera. You know, we've all had to flirt with that idea at some point as sports fans, like where, like where does the line stop? And yeah, like Formula One has had that issue, especially when a lot of fans are coming off the back of, a show that has absolutely gained it traction that it didn't have beforehand. Um, and just, you know, pe coming to terms with that in the, in, where, where the new world where F1 is. And like I said, to my previous point, like, I don't think a lot of fans realize, I know very, people are very quick to say, oh, you're a DTS fan, you're a new F1 fan, et cetera, et cetera. We were all new fans at some point or another. And it's a lot more exposed now because of the world of social media, because we're all on it. And it's 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 an open forum. And that, that a lot of that can be nasty. I mean, especially the subsequent effects of things like again, you mentioned Abu Dhabi earlier, Kira. Nicholas Atifi got death threats as a result of that uh, as a result of of what happened in, in Abu Dhabi and I'm sure it didn't help that all of that was was highlighted on the show again to make people re remind them or regurgitate some of that anger, so to speak. And yeah, of course, that is also a drawback. But at the same time, I would also say, like I said, where is this sport going to get any audience from? Like, I, I, I don't know about you guys. I pay my sky bills every month. They go up and up. You know, what we, the sport is not that accessible in the UK. You're going to have to spend a lot of money on things like obviously a skybox broadband tv a sports subscription on top of what you've already got other countries have gone the same way i know france and china and germany have all gone away from um free to air models and we were spoiled we had f1 on free to air for my tv from the mid 90s all the way i think until the bbc's last full time year i think it was 2012 or something like that um we were spoiled and the way sports are being broadcast now as well like it's going to be harder to access for people without paying more and more money as well. That's going to be another factor as well. So yeah, like I, I think it's an overall huge net positive that we've got DTS and the, the sport can be a lot more um, accessible to certain people. I, like, I'll, I'll let you on a little secret. I used to work in, in the gambling industry. I used to work in the bookies and the amount of people that spoke to me about formula one, knowing I was a formula one fan, after DTS and just wanting to talk about it, 
shot up four or five times over because they'd watched it on Netflix and then wanted someone to talk to about it. Um, that And that's how word of mouth spreads. That's how a sport grows in audience. Um, so, and there is, there is quite a, a painful and sort of disappointing thing about, and I was just thinking about this when you were talking, Dre, um, the time it's become the most accessible in some format through Netflix, which is probably a subscription a lot of us have anyway, is the time when it's, starting to move as a result moving further and further away from being something realistically the people who wanted the easy access for the sport can have because you don't have terrestrial coverage anymore you've got to pay all these subscriptions you mentioned and ticket prices are going up and it, it's kind of a catch-22 of it feels like formula one have potentially used this as a, a platform to get more people interested who never had access before but then also kind of shut the door on them on the other side of it. It was like, thank you for your interest and the money you're making us, but you can't come in. And that's what I would say is another downside of this. Yeah, 100%. I mean, a great example of this is how much more expensive ticket prices have become, especially this year. I feel like it, it definitely became noticeable, you know, the last couple of years. But this year, you know, I, it's just crazy how the difference between this year and last year in terms of actually trying to go to a Grand Prix. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely like dynamic you said, pricing. Yes, <laughs> we love that. Yeah. We love dynamic pricing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I like the to... way you put it. Like, hello to all these new people, but actually, we're going to shut the door right now. Yeah, yeah. it's like, and just like we're not ignoring the cynicism of it. The sport's absolutely rubbing its hands together with this new, exciting younger chunk of fans coming in and they're going to try and you know, they, they absolutely will try and make their own money off these people because why wouldn't you that's what that's what sporting opportunism is and look netflix are rubbing their hands together because how many spin-offs of, of this show are we now getting on netflix now as well i mean i've seen breakpoint just came out which is their tennis version of the show i know there's a pga tour one coming out for golf as well and the tour de france has got their own version coming out later this year as well so netflix are absolutely milking this for all it's worth and so are the sport that's what yeah. that's what capitalism is baby and I, I guess it's a frustration as well that when we're talking about andretti try, i know i'm sort of this is completely rogue shout but <laughs> when we're talking about andretti coming into the sport and one of the main problems with that is the teams saying we're not going to be compensated for our, our loss in value enough the selfishness on the back of such success if the fans generally want something and you're saying, oh, but that'll cost us money, mm. Formula One is getting so much money to compensate for that and in turn please the fans and keep a connection going. And sometimes it can feel like it's just cold, hard business. And I know it is, but there are ways of doing business and making money whilst also thinking about the fans. And I think, especially with the FIA in the last couple of years, we've seen decisions that you know haven't had the fans' best interest at mind. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed or like you're, you're not showing up in the way that you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you, because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. Everyone needs to take care of their mental well-being, even hotshot Formula One drivers. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash WTF1 today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash WTF1. And we're back at it. <laughs> I've now realized how weird it is to watch someone doing an ad read, but also knowing that people can see me too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you do with yourself? I was so conscious of it. I was all. like grinning until I realized it was for better health. And I was like, well, I can't, I can't look happy about this. But also, <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to echo the message that I think therapy is very important. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. 100%. So let's get into a little bit on the best of DTS so far. And we've had four seasons now. Uh, I mean, again, we kind of know how the cake is baked regarding DTS at this point. We know it's it's what they think are, is intriguing about Formula One seasons as we've gone on. But I wanted to talk about what you think are some of your favorite moments in DTS so far. So who wants to start us off with things that have jumped off to you since watching it? I'll go. Sure, go for it, Karen. If you don't mind, Hannah. Of course. <laughs> 
Thank yeah. you very much. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, and this is something that only came to me about 10 minutes ago, but <laughs> the relationship with Hass just consistently from the show's conception and how Hass are perceived, and especially Gunter Steiner, I think is world-class marketing from Hass. <laughs> and you've got to think, the struggles they have had in the last few years, like, would they still be in this position without that positive coverage from Drive to Survive, without the Steiner ship, without things like that, without the, I can't say the word, but he does not smash my door. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they has have managed to build a brand outside of the sport, sort of in a way. And it's obviously, again, it's very personality based. But I just think it's a great idea. Attach yourselves to one of the struggling teams. And I'm sure they're hoping, as I said in Hot Takes Wednesday, Hass will be pushing up the field in the next couple of years, which they <laughs> particularly agree with at the time, which <laughs> is understandable. But, Cast for the title fight, question mark. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, let's not go back into that. Listen to our previous Hot Takes Wednesday if you'd like to find out what that was about. <laughs> but I, I, th I think it's very interesting. It's a very interesting approach, and it, I think it's fascinating how much that has helped Hass as a team. And I don't know, maybe it's been influential in, well, when they got Mick Schumacher, which we know how that ended, um, which saddens some people. But also this new link with MoneyGram, could that be... Could it be a factor? Maybe not. Could be completely unrelated, but I just find it interesting. 100%. 100%. Uh, yeah. Like, I think Hass have started giving away Gunther T-shirts. I mean, you would never, ever, under normal circumstances, wear a team principal's face on a T-shirt. I would. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, apart from Hannah, clearly. Um, Which but, team principal has the most T-shirtable face? Oh, that is a good question. I mean, it has to be Gunther, I think. I'd wear a Christian Horner one just to annoy people. Sorry, sorry, Drake. Mm. Sorry, Drake. No, no. That, that, I that, actually that, do that. have Toto Wolf on a T-shirt. I was joking, but I do. I forgot. Anyway. Okay. How, 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 we have to. We have to get this in real quick. How it's do a, you have it's a like Toto T-shirt? It's a one where he's like about to smash a table. It's like embroidered. It's oh, actually that quite one. Cool. <laughs> I, I think from uh, Saudi Arabia 2021, where he's about to hammer the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's had a, to be. He's had a few with them, to be fair. So I believe that just like went over my head. I forgot. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, do you want to go next, Anna, or do you want me to take one? Well, it is. I probably should go next, just because. Mm. My first one I was going to bring up was how the team principals really stepped up their game as far as like memes and popularity goes. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, you kind of, you know, touched on this already, Kieran, but, you know, you have uh, Gunter Steiner's doors, Total Wolf's tables, um, just the team principals before, I'm sure they had, you know, people that recognise them, of course. Uh, but now it's just sort of they have their complete own fans. It's great. <laughs> um, imagine, I, I mean, you may meet an F1 fan now who's not a fan of the drivers, but is a fan of the team principal. Um, but I think it's hilarious. And also the one of the funny things about Drive to Survive is just how many celebrities pop up out of nowhere i remember seeing this one clip of sam smith like i can't remember what he was reacting to but he was just in the garage like oh. and i use the clip all the time in like my own videos but he's just the celebrity that i would least expect to see in a formula one you know situation and i just find it so funny um so that was my first point was the team principles and you know, random celeb appearances. So we kind of had a similar, similar first one. Oh yeah, certainly. Um, that's that's absolutely uh, a, a factor. I would never thought that like the team principals would have fandoms to a degree in their own right. And I know, I know Toto is very popular. And at some point, Andy, you're gonna have to wear that Toto T-shirt on a oh, podcast. Yeah. That that has to happen. Like I will get it out. <laughs> you, you you heard it Maybe here word first. It differently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like we absolutely will make this happen at some point, one one hundred percent. So yeah, hundred percent. Um, yeah, gosh, um, one of my favorite moments, and it's, it's a bit more of an emotional moment. But I, I I would like to talk a little bit about um the redemption of of Pierre Gasly uh, was one that leaped off the page to me in seasons two and three. Um, for those who may not know, he he used to be at Rebel Racing, and he, he got the big promotion from the artist now known as Alpha Tauri. It was Toro Rosso at the time. Um, got that first opportunity in season two. A lot of the focus 
um, was on Gasly trying to fit into that team. And they they tried really, really hard to encourage him at first. Like first three rounds were like, okay, you know, you're like it's hard to be on Max's level. And, and, and you know, they were, they were trying to get Gasly up the order, but it, it was pretty clear as the season went on, that they were giving up on him really, really quick. I remember distinctively the, the line of the moment when I think it was Horner talking to Dr. Marco and then Hel- and Christian saying, oh, he's losing four temps in the last two corners. Me and you could do that, which is just damning. But it's also reflective of just how we talk about these drivers. It was like I was on Twitter all over again, only for real, um, and not the social media vacuum that Twitter can be. And then getting to season three and then getting to Monza, seeing him back at where he started at Alpha Tauri and then winning that Italian Grand Prix in Monza and the redemption story that was. Because, I mean, in between then, his house had been robbed, his childhood friend, Antoine Hubert, passed away in that horrible Formula 2 accident at Spa, um, in the interim of, of that as well, and so like he he had a, a a very tough time of it emotionally, and we could see all of that raw and 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 bare on on screen, and seeing him turn around and win that race for, for Alpha Tauri and have his little redemption moment was incredible. Like it was a very good flowing narrative from one season to another and it was great it was it was fantastic tv that is the good side of what this show can do and yeah it was one of the most emotional moments um i can think of from dts um yeah, and when they're scraping out scraping his number off the car and the oh. walls of the garage and putting albon up like we love oh, albon great guy but it, it, it kind of really sunk home and, it, and and that's what what you're sort of saying, Dre. That's the good side of DTS. It, it's the good. It's a good and positive side of showing drivers as human beings. Hundred um, percent. And if they didn't focus so much on the opposite side of trying to make villains or trying to make you know make people out to be worse than they are, then which I kind of think maybe is what Max Verstappen was pushing towards, and he seems to have maybe got his wish with that. But I'd rather focus on the positives and the successes. Um, like that because you're right that was a top moment yeah absolutely um going around going around the room again if anyone wants to get another one of their favorite highlights in feel free i, I think, think uh, sorry I don't know. I don't know. um i think verstappen versus hamilton at silverstone that's what i was gonna say really <laughs> we just keep having the same points um well i'll say half of my point and then you can carry on <laughs> um this the 2021 uh Silverstone race was I mean what a race it was very controversial very crazy I mean the last two Silverstone races have been so I'm excited to see if Silverstone 2022 is as good as 21 was on Drive to Survive um but I just remember watching I mean however you think about that situation at Silverstone like whoever side you were on put that to the side for a sec um Drive to Survive did a really good job at changing people's opinions on things which can be quite a bad thing uh but I remember watching it and thinking I didn't quite think of it in that way when watching the race live or I feel like it's uh just a reminder that you know what you see on drive to five you have to take with a pinch of salt of course um and you know you get that they have to make a program they have to make a narrative they have to make it dramatic which you know is part of the success of drive to survive but um yeah I just remember watching uh, that episode of Silverstone 2021, um, loving it. I mean, it, you get to relive that amazing race through Drive to Survive, which is one of my favourite things about the series in itself. Um, but also, I just remember thinking, you know, oh, okay, I'm kind of looking at things from a different point of view, but because Drive to Drive to Survive has that um, thing of slightly twisting things or putting different radios on certain things, you kind of have to even if you do start to think about something in a different way, you kind of have to like take a step back and be like, oh, but is that really what happened? So for me, that moment sticks out just because, you know, it kind of made me think about things in, you know, a wider sense, not only for Drive to Survive, but, you know, reality TV in itself. So, yeah, I I really did like that moment, I think. Yeah, and I I completely agree. And I think, Obviously, during the race and in the we have the post race interviews with Horner and Wolf after an incident like that, and Hamilton, um, we have the team radio to Michael Massey. We hear these things in part 
during the actual race itself. But I just find it fascinating to take these moments that are obviously so controversial and so crucial for a season and then really go with that incident in particular, mega far behind the scenes. And look, I'm sure, and I was going to say this before, but I'll bring it up now. I'm sure Christian Horner is constantly aware of when there is a camera on him. He knows exactly, he plays a part. And I was, saying that, I was saying this in Hot Takes Wednesday. I think he's incredible at what he does. But having him and following him after a controversial incident that involves one of his drivers is just an absolute gold mine because he is so upfront about it. And he's obviously slamming home his opinion, which is going to be incredibly biased. But equally, sort of seeing that back and forth between the teams in the paddock rather than on a Sky Sports microphone, I think is really interesting. I find it fascinating. And also just, I was just going to add on to that, the coverage of Abu Dhabi 2021. I know it's a race a lot of people don't want to talk about, but I think it's one of the most entertaining bits of sport in general I've ever seen. Um, and I know that goes back to should it have been entertaining, but I think it was a remarkable moment. I think they covered it well in terms of the drama during the race, sort of Checo defending Lewis and, you know, the famous Latifi crash and the ac- and the safety car that followed. But maybe they did not cover the controversy surrounding it quite as well. Showed yeah. clips of it, but they didn't go in depth into what was completely wrong about it. Yeah. I have so. to say, I purposefully didn't watch the Drive to Survive uh, episode of Abu Dhabi. I don't know why. I just thought it's too soon. It was what, <laughs> like three months later, but it was too soon. <laughs> yeah. I've, um, yeah. I, I also want to talk about one of the big name stars that I think the show has done a really good job of profiling, and that's Daniel Ricciardo. Like, Daniel Ricciardo is featured heavily in this show, and it's for understandable reasons. He's, you know, him being Australian is always going to be interesting because they they are very outspoken people. They are very honest people. Um, And, like, Ricciardo is full of charisma. He has no problem speaking his mind. He can be a bit funny. He can be a bit goofy. He, I, I could totally get why he appeals to people that aren't normally F1 fans. He's got that sort of frat boy sense of humor that I think appeals to a lot of people. And, if you follow his journey through the seasons, like when he was at Red Bull to start off with, you know, we, we, see, we see about him trying to take on Verstappen. He doesn't like losing. We get a bit of a profile of his history. Obviously, he's, they think they talk to his parents over the course of the show and um, getting to know him a bit better. Him leaving Red Bull to go to, you know, Renault, now obviously Alpine, um, and struggling for that first year. And by the time that first year's come and gone, he's already flirting with McLaren. Uh, He's already in talks with Zach Brown. And you could see how it's all going to fall apart as it goes on, which is amazing given his second year at Renault was incredible. He was fantastic that final year he was in yellow. But he'd already been courted. Um, by Zach Brown and McLaren and seeing how that was going to go down um, over the course of, you know, the two, three year rolling journey. The I, I call it the rise and fall of, of Daniel Ricciardo um, and over the course of the seasons and seeing that journey. And obviously some of the aforementioned tangents like Cyril Abitable and Christian Horner fighting it out is always fun because Renault, obviously being the boss of Renault, they used to supply Red Bull at one point with their, their power unit era in, in the V6 era that we're now in. There was much beef regarding that. I, I also love, I don't know if anyone's ever caught that moment where Cyril talks about Daniel like, like a jilted ex-girlfriend. Like he's going to regret this move to McLaren. And it turns out he was right all along about that. But he did sound like a jilted ex-girlfriend talking about Daniel. Like he's like he's just left the, like, the breakup text and walked out of the house. Um, <laughs> it was very, very funny. Um, but uh, on a quick side note, it's time for another ad break. Happy New Year from our friends over at Manscaped. The ball has officially dropped, but that doesn't mean you have to drop the ball on your balls in 2023. Join the 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive go-to offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code WTF1 for 20% off plus free shipping. This year, take your package to the next level with their Performance Package 4.0 and other premium wet goods. Inside the Performance Package 4.0, you'll find a signature lawnmower 4.0. The advanced skin safe technology reduces cuts and nicks on your delicate parts. It also comes equipped with a 4000K LED spotlight that will shine a light to the promised land 2023 looks to be. 
A grooming routine isn't complete without applying Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver before showing off your 2023 self. These unique formulations take care of the smelliest part of your body and are a big boost to your confidence going into the new year. To complete the set, Manscaped threw in their shed travel bag and anti-chafing box of briefs as free gifts to keep all your goodies stored comfortably. If you really want to make 2023 the year to remember, make sure to try out Manscaped's wet goods as well. This includes their ultra-premium body wash, two-in-one shampoo, and body deodorants. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WTF1 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code WTF1. Pretty smooth, that. <laughs> I mean, after you've used I... some Manscaped products, it will be. <laughs> <laughs> I specifically, like, like had the microphone in front of Kieran in my view because he was laughing. I didn't want to start like, giggling. I didn't, I didn't laugh. I, well, I, no, but I, your face, you were about to. I no, tell. no. I was showing overwhelming support for our friends at Manscaped because they make excellent products. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. We, and we, we you get 20% off with code WTF1. Exactly. <laughs> um, we need to see how much of that makes the final cut. Um, but, Hopefully uh, none of it. <laughs> but has anybody got any more of their favourite moments from DTS before we move on? I just wanted to add um, about Daniel Ricardo, and I don't, I don't know if it's bad to go back to something we talked to talked about before an ad, but there was that moment, wasn't there? With like, because it was a rise and fall of Daniel Ricardo, like you said, but then the rise again, that win yeah. at Monza. Yes, and I think <laughs> so many of us saw that last season. It's like I never left. We saw it as like finally, and I think this season's going to be absolutely crushing oh. when it comes to the fall. Oh. Because I, I reckon Netflix were sort of thinking oh, he could be pushing for, you know, podiums constant, consistently every race. This could be amazing. What an arc. And it's not gone that way. It's no. not, that's not happened. It's no, not happened. very sad. I feel like that was one of the most interesting things about Drive to Survive as well. Is like, you know, people who watch Drive to Survive before F1 itself, they don't necessarily, st- I mean, they see, I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Drive to Survive started in Daniel's final year at Red Bull, I think, or possibly his first year at Renault. Um, And so, you know, unless you go and watch back actively, you don't see that, you know, amazing stint he had at Red Bull, you know, you know, for the first couple of years or, you know, people used to think he was championship potential. Some people still think that, you know, which is interesting, but uh, you don't necessarily see that. beginning part of people's careers maybe I mean the same with Vettel as well Mm. Um, but it's you know you obviously want people to know how amazing these drivers were or like will be or you know whatever it is but drive to survive is kind of you miss that but you know you can't blame people it's just you know how it is yeah about how people enjoy their media and consume it is ultimately down to them and that's ultimately what makes it interesting um one more point i wanted to get into before we get into the final section here as well is grosjean's fireball for Haas in bahrain is oh boy and it's 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 doubly emotional because I, I believe this was the very first season of the show and i do also distinctly remember that they were talking about some of grosjean's previous wrecks that he'd already had in his career so the, the producers were clearly setting this up for when it actually happens in Bahrain. And when it actually happens, it is still every bit as mortifying as it was watching it live at the time. That was a horrible, horrible incident. But again, it it did a very, very good job of capturing people's emotions in the moment and just wondering if he was going to be okay. Because in terms of accidents and like visual impact of what happened, I mean, the car split in half and it had a huge fireball explosion, um, which... Not to be too TV producer and too cynical, like the producers were probably loving that. Like, oh my god! Like, it, like sometimes a crash looks worse than it is. Sometimes it is car split in half, fireball. It's like well, it, what will be appealing to a six year old who doesn't understand what F one is. Like, and yeah, seeing all that, seeing the emotion that came with that, absolutely terrifying. But also loved again that Grosjean completely leaned into it, embraced it for what it was. And if anyone's seen him since an indie car, he now literally calls himself the Phoenix, which I think is just hilarious. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. He's just, he's completely leaned into it. He's donated towards fire departments and things like that as well in the U S since, since joining IndyCar. So like, it's, it's very, very cool in that sense, but also a very, very 
tough visual moment to watch that like we're F1 fans and we thought that was startling. Imagine if you're not an F1 fan watching this show for the first time and seeing that, um, especially the way they built up to it was, I was very clever from the production department, but yeah. Oh gosh. Visually terrifying. That was. It also yeah. reminds you like how dangerous the sport is as well. And if you, I mean, it reminds you as well, it's not just entertainment, it is actually people's lives that are being affected by this. And sometimes you can forget that, you know, as the viewer. Um, but it is that was definitely a huge reminder for me, and I'm sure like many other people that this, you know, these drivers do like risk risk their lives. Um, but yeah. I yeah. think it yeah, I think it's something that me and many fans just completely take for granted. Yeah. Well, I think it is interesting as well because um I've not watched that episode in quite a while, I'll be honest, but from what I remember, it, there's a lot of preaching about how so this is why we make the cars the way they do now. This is why we implement these things. And I, I definitely agree with that, but it would also have been interesting to see. And I, I, I hope this wasn't in there and I look like an idiot now, but Seb Vettel's take on the whole thing, which was that that should never happen. Right. That, that was not everything working as it should. That should not happen. And obviously that would sort of slightly spoil the whole message of it, and which is a good one. I don't think anyone wants to see drivers getting killed on track. It's horrific. It's a horrific thing. And I'm glad it's so, so infrequent and so rare now, thanks to the advancements we've made. Um, but I think that it's a moment that's become fairly memed um, in, in terms, not, not the crash itself, of course, but the drive to survive coverage of how stretched out it was and how long it made it. And Will Buxton as well. Um, and I'd like to apologize to Will for the first the worst impression I've ever done or anyone's ever done of him on a YouTube video <laughs> today, um, mm. which the comments were happy to tell me about. So thank you. I appreciate that. But <laughs> I, I think, Dre, what you were saying about how cleverly it was built up, it's a moment that deserves that breathing out. Because if it was done just at speed, we watched the whole thing in real time. He's in, he gets over the barrier, gets into the uh, ambulance. It doesn't do it justice. It doesn't do the significance of that moment justice. And I think we can all be very happy to see him back and rising from the ashes um, and carrying on doing his thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. 100%. To make a comparison to another documentary that, that came out a couple of years ago when the Schumacher documentary came out on Netflix. If you watch that, um, like they immediately raw just show the crash that killed Ayrton Senna in 1994 out of nowhere and there's there's no warning there's no content warning or trigger warning or anything along those lines it just happens and it just it was like whoa whoa damn i wasn't expecting that and like obviously as an, as a long time fan you know what happens most people who have seen even pictures of that incident know what that was about and it, it was raw and visceral and yeah you're absolutely right i mean there is something about breathing out when watching these things and the emotional side of it that i think a lot of these docu films or docu series in general just don't seem to touch on and i think that's a very very well made point that you made there kieran 100 percent well that's some of the best of drive to survive so far um and of course again we're, we're all building up here towards season five which again comes out in just over five weeks time or just under five weeks time i should say february 24th so this is one thing i've got to ask you guys as well what do you want to see covered in season five um what was your best moments of, of last season what do you think absolutely deserves more insight more context behind the scenes what do you want to see in DTS season five? I'm going to go around the horn a couple of times here. So let's start off with Kieran, shall we? I, it's always a good place to go, I reckon. And I, I desperately, desperately want to see more about Suzuka, just as a race in general. Um, because of all the races last season, after that initial period, sort of for the first chunk of the season where we thought there might be a close fight, it was kind of you kind of became a little bit numb to it, or I did anyway, personally. Sort of the drama wasn't within the results because once Verstappen's got a two second lead, you sort of think, ah, oh, well, that's done now. But Suzuka made me feel angry. And I know I wasn't alone in that when that um obviously Carlos crashed and then the tractor comes onto track and seeing Gasly go past with such poor visibility at the speed he was. Um and the initial thought, obviously, it just harks straight back to horrific incidents we've had before in the sport. And things that we never thought would be allowed to happen again did. So that made me angry, and I would like to see more about that. And I'm not sure we necessarily will, because I think 
why would the FIA, why would the why would F1 sanction something to point out their failures in such a manner? I don't think they would. Um, but like I remember seeing Gasly's reaction at the time when they got back to the garage under the red flag and he was just incensed. And no one really understood what it was about until we saw that footage. But something I would also like to see covered is the the reaction from the FIA and F1 and Sky Sports as well, to be fair. Paul DeResta and Karun Chandok having a go at Gasly for that. And like I say, this is this is fantasy land because it's not going to happen. We're not going to see that. But of the things this season that have made me feel something the most, anger, which somehow ended up in one of the funniest things I've ever seen in Max Verstappen sitting awkwardly in the throne, not quite believing he's won after Johnny Herbert has told him during Sergio Perez's interview that Max has won the title. Just one of the most <laughs> bizarre moments. And I'd been awake for a good four hours at that point in the middle of the morning. And I had I was loopy. I thought I was visualizing things. <laughs> it's just the most bizarre way to win a world championship. But yeah, Japan in depth, I would like as much about Japan as possible. Yeah, I was gonna say, like Japan is one of those just it was the first thing that I wanted to write down on that list was well, when we were planning this was just Japan because not just the Gasly incident, the horror that came with that, the almost Bianchi vibes that came with that horrible moment in Japan, but also the race itself, the fact that we didn't know how many points were going to get handed out because of the confusing nature of the rule book and how many laps do we have to complete before we get to half points, three quarter points, how far do the points go down? And then as, as Kieran quite beautifully said, the only person who got it right. And I think it was probably by accident was Johnny Herbert doing the post-race <laughs> interviews. <laughs> I don't think it was on purpose because everyone was just quickly shuffling through the rule books and figuring out like, okay, is it four points or not? And then, like having to tell Max in the middle of Park Fermi, oh, but by the way, mate, you actually are world champion. Here's this special chair we made for you. Um, all of that was complete carnage. And even then, he wouldn't have won the title if it wasn't for Leclerc getting a post-race penalty for for um, taking leaving the track and gaining an advantage against against Checo. Oh boy, God. Um, I think uh, Max winning his second title deserves a whole episode in itself because yeah. the confusion surrounding that was just unbelievable. And if you compare it to the season before winning the title, having a title rival, first of all, the last lap of the last race, like we all know about it, and then compare it to winning a race and then finding out you've won the championship in the post-race interviews from Johnny Herbert is just hilarious to me. And he, you know what is quite sad? Max never got his, you are world champion. I think, you know, Christian Horner may have said something after, on the... Didn't they? Yeah, he said coaster. something on the, the radio to him, which, you know, didn't quite hit the same, but, you know, there we go. Um, he never got that on the actual day. and Like you said, he sat, sat in the throne, but I'd love to see the Red Bull garage during that time on Drive to Survive. Yeah, what, like whether they're flipping through the rule books or just like wanting to celebrate but not celebrating too early because, exactly. you know, you don't want to embarrass yourself if you're like screaming and shouting, winning a world championship, and it turns out that you haven't. Um, but the Red Bull Garage, I would love to see in Drive to Survive. <laughs> I, want, I want to see Jonathan Wheatley, their sporting director, furiously shuffling through a giant rule book, figuring out the loophole that says, oh, by the way, we had a checkered flag, so it's full points. Yes. Um, like that, that, would be, that would be a sight. And also um, a, a montage of all the moments where full points came up on the screen on the screen. Oh, Oh, God, yeah. and and everyone was saying obviously they're not the, the points we'll be getting and everyone's <laughs> just completely ignoring what was actually being said by and, again, and again the, the 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 graphics guys in the in formal management they, they had it right they had it right the whole time and it turns out the broadcasters and everybody else didn't it was oh it was not sky's crazy. best day not no, sky's it, best day i don't think it was anyone's best day <laughs> to be honest with you um it was, it was a struggle for well it was lance time. stroll's best day because his start was incredibly strong and one of the sexiest things i've ever seen of, of, of course you had to get that in there didn't you yeah, mm. yeah you, you had to get that in hannah your turn what do you what, what do you what do you want to see from season five well sticking on the red bull kind of subject red bull their teammate um thing how do you even talk about this at brazil the controversy around the you know whether they will swap places you know what's going to happen surrounding that you know that on drive to survive i feel like it's just going to be chef's kiss if they show it i really hope they do because 
you know, in terms of watching F1, you know, that's the kind of, that moment was the most I'd ever seen drivers not slag off, but like talk about their teammate in a negative way post-race. I think Perez said, you know, something like, oh, after all I've done for him or, you know, stuff like that, which, you know, you don't typically see that, you know, you have to be very, you know, by the book, especially like post-race and everything. You never say anything bad about your teammate or the team or whatever. But that moment, I mean, I feel like it was pretty one-sided in terms of the fan reaction and, you know, F1 fans watching that race, you know, who knows, but maybe there was a couple people that were on Max's side. I didn't see them. I feel like everyone was on Perez's side, to be honest. If you two are one of them, then let me know. But it was kind of Perez, I felt, was in the right. And, you know, Max, Max's reaction post-race was interesting to me. And I really, 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 really want to see behind the scenes uh, of that moment because... I hope they were filming it because it would have been intense, especially the, you know, engineering debrief or they have to meet up at some point post-race. So they must have talked about it. Um, and I felt like it was not a very nice thing for Max to do, but, you know, that's just my opinion. So I don't know. I would love to see that on Drive to Survive and how it actually played out because we only get to see a small chunk of what happens on TV. Yeah, I think it, it was a very confusing situation in general because, I mean, my initial reaction was the same as yours. It was, what is Max doing? And then I zoomed out a little bit and thought, well, if he's a faster car, like, how much do you expect him to slow down to, like, how much do you want to enforce these orders? But then I think the whole aspect of the potential Monaco uh, qualifying incident, and look, we don't know how true that is. Did Would Perez crash deliberately and then admit it? It... It's a weird one. And anything that stems from Ralph Schumacher, I'm slightly doubtful of most of the time. <laughs> exactly. But equally, it would kind of make sense in some regard. And I don't know if we'd ever find out. I don't think Red Bull would ever allow that to be admitted to anyone publicly. They're smarter than that. Um, and they'll be furious that it got to that stage. But if we can see that covered, absolutely. I would like to see that very much. Yeah, 100%. And let's not forget George Russell's first F1 win. You know, the, the small, unimportant matter of Merck's finally getting their one win for the year and George Russell's first as a Formula One driver and beating Lewis Hamilton straight up to do it. Um, and like, it was a one-two. One-two, yeah. yeah. A one-two finish as well. The, uh, the yeah, it was quite the weekend to say this. I mean, it, like, that's why I mentioned it on Hot Takes Wednesday yesterday that uh, that was my pick for race of the year. It had just about everything you could possibly wish to have in an F1 race. And let's, let's not forget, it's like George Russell winning was like the third tier story amongst all of this. Like we've barely even mentioned Verstappen and Hamilton hitting each other early on, um, mm -hmm. continuing their rivalry and again, the team order scandal but he, let's not forget George Russell won that race. Um, so it, all of that is is up there for me. Well, Kevin Magnussen as well. Oh, yeah. And K-Mag on pole? We completely forgot about Kevin Magnussen like, on pole. Comeback season. I mean, the Drive Survive will absolutely follow that because it's Haas. It's oh, someone's yes. comeback season and he gets yeah. on pole. We'll forget what Daniel did to him. We'll forget what, what happened. Yeah. But incredible, incredible stuff. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, like K-Mag essentially hitting the gritty on top of his F1 car after celebrating <laughs> his first win is... A beautiful shot. A beautiful sight shot. to behold, um, I have to say. Um, I hate to say that when I think of Brazil, it goes uh, Red Bull um, situation, mm. K-Mag pole, and then George Russell's win is the third thing that I think of. I don't like that, but it's true. It's true. You, you, you think of the drama and the negative first. That's just how we are as humans. I completely understand that. Like, and like, again, it was mentioned in our chat as well a second ago, Ocon and Alonso had beef twice that weekend as well. They hit each other twice that weekend. Barely even mentioned. Brazil, the more you think about it, the more crazy it is. And it's, it, it was a classic Brazilian Grand Prix. That race produces more pound for pound drama than almost any track um year to year on earth and last year's did not disappoint um before i give you my first a couple of points before we get into it it's time for one more ad read yes <laughs> and, and it's from our friends at uh, express vpn Every parent tells their children not to talk to strangers but our parents is good at protecting their children online express vpn is here to help Every device you own, phones, computers, tablets, has a unique IP address, which is like an internet phone number and reveals personal information about you, like where you live. 
If you've ever clicked on a sketchy link or opened an email with a bugged image, your IP address could be exposed, and who knows who is looking at it. ExpressVPN is an app that hides your real IP address and replaces it with a dummy one, keeping you safe and private. It's so easy to use, just download the ExpressVPN app on your phone or computer, tap one button to turn it on, and you're protected. And here's the coolest part about ExpressVPN. They let you choose what country you want your IP address to look like it's coming from. This is super useful because services like Netflix and Disney Plus give you different shows depending on what country you're in. To secure your family's online activity and unlock tons of new shows by visiting expressvpn.com slash WTF1. Use our link and you can get three extra months on the house. That's expressvpn.com slash WTF1. Visit expressvpn.com forward slash WTF1 to learn more. For my first point, I have to say... I, I'm I'm going to be a homer here. Sebastian Vettel's retirement. Um, for those who don't know me all that well, I'm a huge Sebastian Vettel fan. Um, and that was, for me, one of the most unifying Formula One moments I have ever seen as a fan. Like, it's rare that everyone on the sport is on the same page. And this was one of those incredibly rare occasions where it was it was the Sebastian Vettel weekend by all accounts and it and everybody just seemed to just like it and love it and it was emotional and it was great and you know the stand innovation the guard of honor after the national anthem the you know, the tribute helmets Fernando Alonso one of his greatest rivals has a Sebastian Vettel tribute helmet he 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 said to Vettel before the race even started I'm not going to challenge you into turn 1 like this is Alonso, one of the greats yeah. of all time, backing down for Sebastian on his final race and almost going like full emo with it, um, which I, I would never expect to see with Fernando because I still love the fact that Sebastian did did another podcast and said that you know, me and Alonso aren't really friends. And like Alonso is just like, I'm going to move aside for you, big man. <laughs> it's 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 crazy in that sense. Um, and yeah, like to have all of that happen, you know, the race itself was an emotional one, you know, what didn't quite work out for Aston Martin because they were in their fight for sixth overall and was just short. You know, he was just following, um, you know, following Daniel Ricciardo towards the end of that race and trying to get that one last spot that would, you know, break the tie in the constructors in terms of points. But just seeing the warmth and the tributes and the kind words and like the group photo outside the restaurant on Thursday. I've never seen a shot where all 20 people, all 20 drivers of the grid had all come together for this guy. Um, it was emotional. It was powerful. It was a great tribute to one of the most universally liked sports or, or sports drivers I've seen in F1 in recent times. And I would love to see as much Vettel content from that final day as possible. I say this the same day that Formula One's YouTube channel put out a video of him <laughs> and, and all access to that final race. So, yes, yeah, the, the Vettel fan is kicking in in me. I had to mention that um, as, as well because that was... That, that was a, that was a wonderful moment in my opinion well i, I would completely agree and i i think you know it's difficult because there wasn't much of a fuss made about kimmy's retirement last season no. that i recall and i really hope they don't fall into that trap again because obviously i, I would suggest seb was in his last season a more thought about and currently loved driver i mean kimmy had sort of unfortunately fallen down the pack like seb did uh with alfa romeo but I, I think Seb's four-time world champion deserves a massive send-off. But I also think it's important to kind of look at his career through a lens because we talk a lot now about the hate people get in Formula 1, whether that's a supporter of a team on Twitter, whether that's a team principal, whether that's anyone in the sport. There's so much hatred around. And you've got to look at Seb's journey to being this person the most one of the most loved people in the sport making positive change and everyone shedding tears about him leaving and how many of those people in 2010 2011 2012 2013 absolutely hated the man oh god and yeah. i think it's it's a, it would be a great reflection on how we just react to success as as a race as people we what we do is we hate people to do well we hate people who are doing well and will absolutely show any kind of abuse we can to them. But in the end, when they leave, we realize just how much of a blessing they were and how much we respect that period of dominance 
they had. And I think we'll see things for the people who slate Lewis Hamilton, the people who slate Max Verstappen. Just remember that in eight, nine years, you could be reacting very differently to how you have been recently. <laughs> 100 percent like we in sports hate dominance and that applies to pretty much any sport formula one included i'm a manchester united fan people hate united people hated when golden state warriors were dominating in basketball or when the aussies win the ashes it's we don't like dominance in our sports we like to see it go around a little bit and you know i think you're absolutely right here and i think you're 100 percent spot on i think it's only when people retire do they quote get their flowers in that sense um but yeah like 100 percent, like completely agreed where that's concerned we we do not like dominance at all when it comes to this sport and and how we, we, we prefer it. entertainment do we yeah well, <laughs> well depends on the, the depends on the entertainment kieran that's the important thing um <laughs> let's go lightning round we'll go one more time around the house uh to do, as, a, as a lightning round any more stuff you want to see mentioned in the new season hannah what do you reckon <laughs> Uh, okay, well, Silverstone as a whole, I mean, there, there was many things that happened in that race, but, you know, I can't pinpoint one. There were so many. And, I mean, you guys talked about it a lot yesterday, uh, whether it was overrated or underrated. Check out Hot Takes Wednesday. Um, but for me, it was one of the best races in 2022. Um, obviously, you had the the Joe crash, which oh, obviously, yeah. in hindsight, added to the spectacle of what was the British Grand Prix in 2022. Um, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I remember it being 20 minutes or even close to half an hour before we knew that he was okay. And it was very scary in that moment. Um, but now knowing that he was fine and watching it back, it definitely added to the sort of wow factor of the race. I mean, the way he crashed as well with the barrier and it was mental. And I remember being at Silverstone on the track and seeing a couple of markings where the halo had just skidded across the track which was just crazy to see um but so you had that aspect of it but also you know the last 10 laps of Silverstone was something that I will never forget um just the amount of battles that you had on every single corner not just the battles that you typically get or overtakes on the you know the corners that you normally get overtakes but just everywhere there being uh cars side by side and of course you had the the goat commentary from Crofty, the through goes Hamilton moment, which I think I might have replayed on, on my phone over a hundred times since maybe. Um, but it was a great moment. And, you know, I don't know about people watching at home, but, you know, in the stands, everyone was standing and cheering, not only for Lewis, because it's obviously his home, home race is going to have the support, but not only for that, but for the battle in itself and just being so excited about seeing all of these different cars swapping positions and yeah it was an unbelievable race one of my favorite from the season I have to say um and just all of the different elements of that race in a drive to survive episode would be great because you obviously have the scary moment at the start but you have the exciting on track action and obviously you know just stuff like that surrounding um, the race and how it went and the tension between the different teams still, you know, it was great. I, I really hope to see that on Drive to Spike. 100%. Again, we forget, first time winner. Carlos Sainz won that race. You how know? do I not mention the first time winners? I just seem to forget. <laughs> Another Carlos first Sainz time winner. Such, yeah, such <laughs> a great winner for Silverstone, I have to say. Yeah, Carlos Sainz Jr.'s first win. Barely even mentioned. And the drama with that as well, because they had Charles Leclerc and the broken front wing. Hamilton was right in the mix for a little while. Red Bull was on the back foot. Brilliant race. Brilliant race all round. Um, 100%. Kieran, what do you reckon? Ferrari. Everything Ferrari, everything Ferrari did, everything Ferrari thought about, everything Ferrari tried to do, every fix Ferrari tried, every strategy Ferrari implemented, Ferrari. Um, and, you know, I think one of the toughest moments to watch on Drive to Survive so far for me has been the way Seb was treated and the don't joke around, don't laugh, this isn't what this team's about, we're not doing well, we can't laugh. And I think... That's an attitude Ferrari have and a traditional way of doing things that is outdated and they need to modernize and become ruthless. Um, but yeah, I just want to see their failings and like what it was really like behind the scenes rather than what Mattia Bonotto was telling us. It was mm. like, oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, Monaco and France are the ones that leap off the page, Monaco and get strategic foul up that led to Charles. Like there was two primal roars 
from Charles uh, over the course of that season. The one in Monaco where he's t- where he's, he's coming into the pits at the last minute, the team tells him to stay out and he's already in the pits and rah, just a primal roar. And then obviously France, and that was one of his own making really, where he was in that intense fight with Max and it was just coming into that strategy zone and then Charles spins it, puts it in the wall. And yep, it's it's like in Dragon Ball when Gohan goes Super Saiyan 2. It's just a complete raw primal scream. One for you anime fans out there. But um yeah, <laughs> that was, that was a heartbreaking, and... heartbreaking moment, that sound. It was oh, yeah. like haunting. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, just that, that was just raw visceral anger. You don't get that very often in life. So for that to happen, oh Lord of mercy. One knowing more... drive to survive, we're gonna hear that in the Brazil episode, hundred percent. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, gosh, like that covered most of it. Also, I think we covered most of what I wanted to cover. I mean, as like for Stappen, I, I, I hope for Stappen gets his flowers in this sense as well because. We forget he won 15 races this season, an all-time single season wins record, an all-time points record. Um, It was one of the greatest individual seasons we've ever seen in Formula 1. By any statistical measure, it was off the charts. Um, And it was, you know, incredible to watch. I hope some focus is given to that, because I know Max is, uh, is incredibly divisive. Um, yeah, but uh, I would like to see that covered in well, general. The fact he's in the chair this season, we've seen in the teaser, oh, yeah. I think they'll put a big focus on that, I reckon. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Max, Max, after years of saying he doesn't like this show, doesn't like what it's done, um, he's been very vocal in not being a fan of the show. And what does the teaser, teaser trailer show him in the chair? For season five, and uh, even a poke at his expense about being back in the chair. So that is going to be fascinating. Well, we all know Max is good for a quote <clears throat> at the best of times. So there's going to be a, a bucket load of, of of Verstappen content in there. That that's a given, most certainly. So yeah, th- that'll be absolutely fun. Um, that'll do it for this episode of the WTF One podcast. As said, Drive to Survive Season 5 coming on February 24th on Netflix. Can't wait to see how that all goes down. We'll be back very soon for another edition of the WTF1 podcast. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the show. I've been Dre Harrison, they've been Kieran Oaks and Hannah Atkinson, and we'll see you next time. Sayonara. Bye. Bye.